Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us here. Good morning to those in the West who have also signed in. Today, we're going to have an update from the Chief Operating Officer of Bounty Oil and Gas, Mr. Kane Marshall, who is uh, driving a bit of a transition at this junior energy company, and uh, he's uh, pretty excited to tell you what's going on. He's going to give, you an, give us an update on the Cerberus operations and we have an outlook on Queensland production and we might talk a little bit about impacts the oil price. I'll leave it up to you, Kane, to tell us what's going on. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, this will be fairly brief today. I'll just talk about where we are with uh, Cerberus, um, what's been going on the last few months, uh, not only in terms of technically where we see uh, the project's potential, but the operational side of things and drilling scheduling. And we'll just finish off talking a little bit about our Queensland asset portfolio and uh, where we currently are with production and revenue and where we see um, production opportunities and, and the kind of opportunities we're looking to um, exploit um, leading into a, you know, a, a weaker Aussie dollar and higher commodity price about Cerberus um, in relation to where we are um, in the project. Uh, we've recently acquired some new 3D seismic or some recently reprocessed 3D seismic. Um, that's, uh, we've only really had that for the last month. That's certainly showing that at a number of the larger targets, which we've previously disclosed in September, or well, sorry, October, um, there's potentially some shallower horizons that are highly prolific in other producing oil fields in the area. So our prospective resource in the best case, uh, looking to potentially double, which makes them very attractive. And, you know, that's important because we're positioned right next to the Harriet joint venture with Sandos as operator, who are actually are undertaking a very aggressive drilling program this year. Uh, that's not only in around the Varanus area where um, it's adjacent to Cerberus, but in the beat out sub basin of Carnarvon. And those um, particular geological features uh, are very similar to what we, we see in Cerberus. So that's where we are with, with the project and its technical aspects. Just see a bit of a, um, you know, a map here. And down here, this is what we'd previously um, identified. We had these larger sort of features, honey badger, stork, uh, parent galant, which are defined on 2D seismic. And we're really honing in on this area in here where we've got this newly acquired 3D data and the well, there's actually a well going to be drilled by Sanos. It's actually right here, right on the border of the northern part of the Cerberus project. And that's slated for Q4. So not only are they going to be drilling in and around this area, they're going to be drilling some features um, in the Carnarvon acreage much further to the north. They're going to look a lot like these, um, these features. So that's particularly exciting. Um, so operationally, we've introduced a, um, a team now to execute. We've got a drilling manager. We've got an operations advisor. Uh, I'm sort of joint leading that project with uh, Joseph Graham from, uh, from Coastal. And we've already started the process of permitting our environmental plan, which we anticipate yeah. being lodged uh, next month. And uh, sort of the well engineering side of things. So there's two jackups available in um, the Northwest Shelf, which have currently got availability uh, Q4 of this year. That's the Noble Tom Prosser that's uh, contracted with Santos. And then the Valaris 107, which is contracted with um, various operators, including Vermilion and Jadestone, which uh, have got active campaigns at Stag and Wandu, fields to the north of Cerberus. So we're speaking to both. We've been speaking with Santos on mm. um, potentially slots for for drilling and um, whether we can meet a timeline for Q4 this year on one of those rigs. So that's where we are with, with Cerberus. Um, Peter, did you have any questions about any of that? I was gonna just ask a few questions here that uh, have been coming through about the, the, the oil price. There's a fair bit of strength behind it. And there's obviously some geopolitical impacts to that at the moment, which are positive. Um, yep. How do you see that generally, and and what's the impact on sort of the junior resources sector 
who are out there um, uh, exploring for oil and gas at the moment? Well, I think it's important to note that in the last few years, we've seen a decimation of juniors on the ASX. It's just been a completely unloved sector and it's a, effectively a perfect storm. We've got, globally, we've got record low oil inventories. The, the US drilling and the shale resource uh, drilling programs from major operators ha haven't aggressively picked up as everyone potentially anticipated. Uh, we've already got uh, the OPEC plus uh, consortium talking the last two days. The supply, the supply picture looks like it's going to be fairly bleak. That's even production out of Iraq and Iran. We've got a strengthening US dollar. People are talking about inflation. Um, you know, nothing really happens until people stay affected at the bowels are and everyone forgets what, it, you know, this is a strategic commodity oil and that's why we're focused. It goes into almost every uh, day life products from cosmetics, uh, you know, everything's made, a lot of things made from plastics. Demand is still hundred million barrels a day. Um, you know, and where we are now is Bounty, there's only probably a dozen juniors, if that, focused in Australia. So uh, we've got production. We've got a um, project that we see as has enormous potential for oil located um, in proximity to infrastructure. So the commodity picture, I don't think oil is going to change. If anything, you know, the forecast by um, Goldman Sachs and various other institutions is probably spot on. I can't see us being too far away from $100 oil. And uh, that in equivalent Australian dollar terms is, is very material. Um, when you've got existing production, other fields you can bring into production. Uh, you know, we've had very little exploration happening in Australia, and we've now got a situation where the offshore rig market's now reflecting a pickup in activity. Services costs are, are reflecting uh, pickup in activity. And that's always the way when commodity prices pick up, costs go up. Um, and then everyone starts getting active and we get FOMO and then people start deploying risk capital back in exploration. So I think it's a fantastic time to be in the business. We've seen recently in the last 12 months, um, iron ore prices go through the floor as Chinese um, stopped demand. And then recently the, the jump back up, uh, up to $100 a tonne has really lit the fire into some junior iron ore producers who, like oil and gas explorers had dwindled from a decade ago when there were dozens of them, and now there's only a handful left. And, uh, and Bounty in the uh, oil and gas exploration space is now at 11 million market cap this morning, yep. um, and you've got pretty good cash flow already. So tell us about the cash flow and how that puts you in such the, uh, a good situation to be exploring. Yeah, I think in the last financial year, we had about one half million uh, revenue to the you know, the parent consolidated group companies. And that was really when we had very poor commodity prices. Um, not as, you know, Australian dollar was probably slightly stronger. And we're now in a situation, and that's this is being reflected in the receipts we get from Santos, where, uh, you know, we're probably making 250 to 300,000, depending on, um, you know, what, what exchange rate we're using uh, a month. And, you know, we've just approved the, another infill well at um, Peru North, which uh, that coupled with, you know, the dollar and the high commodity prices is just going to increase our revenue base. So that's, um, you know, particularly so you're paying exciting. your own way, Kane. You're a junior resources company paying your own way and be able to uh, finance a lot of your your exploration activities from uh, your own wallet, which is um, you know, a nice situation to be in for a junior of your size. Um, that, yeah, that's that's right. It's uh, it's a unique situation where we potentially can organically fund other production opportunities in our in our Queensland portfolio, and that's what we're we're looking at. We're very busy as we're looking at doing now is what other opportunities can we bring online uh, apart from service? Uh, you know, if there's um, very I think you know we're mark we're capped at twelve. The fully diluted capital structure is one point three bill or something like that. Um, stock technically is forming a base. Uh, I think people are pretty happy accumulating stock at these levels. So they probably can see this thing's going to pop, uh, you know, with news and increased oil prices and some of the geopolitical tensions that are going on. So, you know, you look at the juniors and we're flying under the radar. And I suppose for some people that's, uh, that's a good thing. They can pick up the stock at, uh, at these levels, including me. So yeah. uh, 
I can't really think of too many juniors that are actually have got production domestically in Australia with with projects with this sort of upside. Uh, most companies have gone, you know, to the US or overseas. So comparably with peers, um, it's it, you know it's really the mid cap range. We're looking at companies like Carnarvon have got an offshore program, uh, and maybe some of the you know mid mid cap players where we can sort of compare to. There's not a lot of uh, you know, you're talking blue, you see where their market cap is, um, who don't have production, it's mainly exploration. So I think there's a lot of uh, that void for us to fill in relation to oil and gas juniors and where we can, we can potentially capitalise on our story. Especially um, oil and gas juniors where one successful hit can be worth uh, multiples of the current market cap. Kane, um, you've come on recently as the Chief Operating Officer. What is it that gets you juiced up about Bounty Oil and Gas and the year ahead? Well, I think corporately the company's uh, very well sponsored by major shareholders who are, who are all buying into, this, into the plan. Uh, and that be, you know, um, shareholders who are from management. We have institutional shareholders now who are looking for us to deliver on what we've promised and execute a plan. Uh, so everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. Everybody knows what the plan is. Uh, so everybody's aligned going the same direction. So I think corporately, that's what gets me moving, uh, being a key part of driving, driving the projects. The other thing is I think we're in a very sort of special window now where we haven't been for a long time. We've got um, supply deficits. We've had very little exploration. We've had a retreat in uh, exploration development offshore. Um, Australia's got major energy security issues. We've shut down our refineries and we've still, you know, there's a lot of uh, tension still between us and China. Um, our our uh, inventories are parked in the US. So something has to give at some point about what we do there, about uh, securing our own, our own fuel security. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, themes that pull together where, you know, we can do things a little bit differently than other juniors. We can, uh, We've got production, we can organically fund other production, we potentially can finance against reserves, uh, we can move very quickly. We're looking at another number of other opportunities in parallel at the moment to, to grow the company's uh, um, you know, the growth portfolio. We're looking at doing some things with the current assets um, to potentially monetize or divest. So there's not, we're not short of things to do. And um, you know, I think it's a perfect time to be busy and in fact, if you're not busy, you're not really sure what you're doing. Uh, the stock doesn't really reflect what, what we're doing, but having said that, that'll sort itself out in due course. I don't think we're overly concerned about that at this point in time. I think so. With this information flow to shareholders and the market, um, we're starting to build some anticipation. So just in summary, what are we looking forward to over the next, next couple of months, Kane? Uh, I think next couple of months, you'd probably see, so corporately, we're going to be start doing, doing some things. Uh, I think... Uh, I'll be probably more more involved there, the company, um, moving the company forward into, into not only Cerberus, but other projects. Uh, you'll see some plans around what we intend to do with some of our current assets and how we intend to get them into production. Um, some plans around some of the assets we haven't spoken about for a long time and how we could, where we're looking to value add those. Uh, we'll also look at um, what, what the peer activity looks like in around service and what Sanos is planning to do, uh, what adjacent uh, targets have been drilled and how they compare to ours. Uh, also the volumes, resource volumes of Cerberus, I'd say they're gonna be materially upgraded based on what we've seen in the preliminary 3D so reprocess seismic. Uh, so a lot of stuff, PEP 11, it's been, you know, that's, that's canceled, disappointing. Uh, you know, for me, we were moving in a different direction anyway. That's still got to play out. Um, there's an election coming. So I think there's a lot of stuff uh, going to be happening in, in this calendar year, and particularly through February and March, as we mature Cerberus, we mature our production opportunities, we're looking for some other potential acquisitions that complement what we've got, um, and really sort of, you know, telling people about the story and make it very clear that really in, the, in, in this sort of uh, peer space, there's a bit of a void, which I think makes, makes it a special story. A prime spot for you right now and that uh, rig in the background that's is something similar to what you'll be using for Cerberus yeah it's similar to the noble Tom Prosser which is 
under contract with Sandos at the moment. Obviously, uh, as I mentioned, who we're talking to. Um, so we'll need that sort of uh, rig if we're going to make a, a you know a schedule of Q4 this year. Uh, one of those two jacket rigs, the Valaris 107, the Noble Tom Prosser. Uh, the benefit of us servers, we're actually located quite close to to shore, so we can do things where we don't necessarily need to helicopter personnel out to the rig. Um, and that's, there's a lot of things there, COVID hanging around at the moment, sort of give us some advantages for a material drilling program. So uh, they're the sorts, you know, that's the sort of things that I think uh, give us a bit of an advantage. I know we're only earning 25% at this point in time, but when you look at 100 million barrels, if we have 25% of that, yeah, and MPV of $20 a barrel, well, we're capped at 12 that reflect the market cap of half a billion. Yeah. Once we get going, now you know, and on speculation of drilling, so there's a lot of upside to run here in stock. Small market cap, big rigs, big prospects, big year ahead. Kane, thanks for talking to us all here today. We look forward to news very soon. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you.